and let's bring up Virginia Martinez. I'm short too. <laughs> and you will excuse me, I am going to use my notes um, because it's a difficult issue, because I'm very emotional this week, and just because I talk a lot and uh, that Nestor told us that there was a time limit, so <laughs> let me start. Um, I started volunteering at the detention center in Dilly, Texas in April of 2016. I didn't know what to expect at the time, but after that first time, I knew I had to come back, and in fact, I've been back seven times since. It was heartbreaking to hear the stories of the women, and it angered me, it pissed me off to hear how Border Patrol agents treated women and children. That detention center is a privately operated uh, center that has a capacity of 2,400 women and children. These are families fleeing extreme violence, mostly from El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Now, both international and U.S. law provide a process through which individuals who are facing persecution can apply for asylum once they're here in the U.S. These families are fleeing murder rates that are the highest in the world, and these countries also have the highest rates of femicide. Individuals and families are held in a Border Patrol processing center, which are known as yeleras, freezers, um, or perreras, which are the kennels you may have seen on television. And then they are usually sent to a uh, detention center like Dili before they are, um, be where they go before an asylum officer. The asylum seeker must provide credible or reasonable fear uh, before being released to continue what can be a very, very long process and getting longer. That, of course, has been changed, and these families now face um, staying in detention until the decision is actually made on their asylum case, which can be years. Children who are traveling with someone other than their parent are separated, even though they may be very young and even though they may be with a tia or an abuela. Um, Boys over 16 are also separated, as are men. They're held in separate detention centers. But you can imagine the impact on others of seeing a crying child torn away from the arms of her grandmother or her aunt. I volunteered for the intake charla designed to let women know who the CARA pro bono, pro bono volunteers are and how we were going to help them. I was shocked by what women told me about the Border Patrol holding cells where they would stay for four or five days before coming to Dili. Individuals are held in freezing cold cells with no beds, no soap, disgusting toilets, and the water is fracking. Texas is a fracking state, so the water is not good quality. In fact, some of the children refuse to drink the water because it smells so bad. The food is the same three times a day. Frozen sandwiches or burritos, which were sometimes moldy and sometimes thrown at them. If children cry, the temperature is lowered even colder. Air conditioning is punishment. Some women and children cross the river, and so they come in soaking wet. Their belongings are taken away from them, and so there they are, freezing cold on cement floors. Not surprisingly, many are sick by the time they get to Dilly. Women talked about how Border Patrol agents yelled at them, called them names, refused to give them necessities such as diapers and sanitary napkins. The border agents also yelled at kids, calling them cochinos and smelly. One mom told me that her son, I think he was about seven, her son saw a Border Patrol agent drinking water, and so he went in and he said, can I have some water? The border agent just told him, go back to your mother, you smell. 
Imagine being that child. By the time families reach the border, these asylum seekers have been on the road for almost a month. They've been running from immigration agents in Mexico, from gang members, from others trying to rob, uh, rape, and kidnap them. A woman told me she had been raped by two men in front of her six-year-old son. They have left after seeing relatives killed, after being threatened themselves, having their children threatened, after being raped or beaten. On intake, I add my apology for how they've been treated by the U.S. so far. As a U.S. citizen, my taxes, your taxes, are supporting the inhuman treatment of children and women and families who are coming here seeking safety. While the conditions in Dili are much better than the Yeleras and the Perreras, their quality of medical care is very low. So women and children who have serious conditions or are ill do not always get the care that they need. Sometimes we have to advocate on their behalf so that they can be taken to the hospital in San Antonio an hour away or get seen and given medication right there at the center. In the second phase of the process, we listen to the, the women's asylum claims and help them arrange their story so that it can be easily understood by the asylum officers that they'll be seen, which they have to go by themselves. We're not allowed to go and represent them. The stories are horrific. The gangs recruit boys, and if they refuse to join, they and their families are threatened with death. Preteen girls are told that they are ready to become girlfriends. If she refuses, she is likely to be gang raped and killed. I was told that sometimes they call the mom while they're torturing the girl so that the mom can hear her daughter scream. I confirmed this with somebody else the next time I went and they said, yeah, it's true, it happened to my neighbor. Sometimes the women are running from abusive husbands. The rates of femicide in these countries are incredibly high and women get very little support even from their own families. Others have small businesses and are subject to extortion. There is no way that women can go to the police because in those countries the police are connected to the gangs or are totally ineffective. When I first went, there was a room where the children could go in and play. There were toys and coloring books, and there was a monitor that showed um, cartoons for them um, while we worked with the moms. There were snacks for the children available as well in a little refrigerator. There are no longer snacks, only a jug of water, fracking water. The room is now unsupervised. We have to ask for a limited number of coloring books and crayons, but the TV monitor is still there. Some of the children will not go into the room because they do not want to leave their mothers. Of course, they are afraid. They have seen people disappear. While I was in the staff room one day, I saw a cuento that a young girl had written. There once was a girl. She was eight years old and liked to play basketball. She told me she liked to play outside here but really she didn't like to be locked up. Why do they lock up children in the U.S.? Why do we lock up children? Why do we deny children medical care? Why do we allow children to die in custody? I'll be going back sometime this year. I don't know when yet. I'll be going back for Jacqueline, Felipe, and other children and adults who have died or will die in Border Patrol custody. Thank you. <laughs>